So my talk will be wrapping around, uh, your head around Swift. And before I start with that, uh, obligatory is um, that I introduce myself, who's not seen me. I'm active as Coconetics on Twitter, on the, on the web, and I like to write blog posts about all my experiences. I've uh, been a full-time iOS developer and blogger since January 2010. Um, that means that is also the amount of time of experience full-time developing in Objective-C. I have another hat. I'm a developer evangelist for this small company, but enough of that. And a quick advertisement for uh, my book, which came out in February. Um, at the moment, uh, with this promo code CTWMOBICF, you get 41% off all books at manning.com. Not just mine. Uh, and if you are so kind and as to tweet some feedback or pictures maybe from me with hashtag MobiConf, um, then I will select one person to receive a free copy of this book. Yeah. So let's get started. This is not a tutorial. Yeah? Um, there are tutorials on the internet that explain everything about Swift, but rather these are subjective observations about Swift in practice. And you might find it funny, <coughs> this, this is actually a car, Swift, Suzuki, and I Appleized it. It's the car of my girlfriend, which I converted to Apple. <laughs> so uh, my story uh, about Swift begins with this app. This is the first app uh, that um, I got approved by Apple. It was the second app I ever submitted. And I published the first version in October 2008. Uh, I wrote it basically to learn uh, Objective-C. Uh, and it, at that time, we didn't have ARCs, so it used manual reference counting. And I did a major rewrite with a new interface December 2012. But then, after July 2012, basically received the latest update and was dead. Yeah, still on the App Store, people were buying it, but it was sort of the nightmare for me. Oh my God, all those people giving me money and I'm never updating the app. So it so happened that um, in June 2015, I sold it to somebody who's now paying me to update it because uh, there is a version 3 planned for this fall. New, new UI, new everything. Um, and uh, I, I have to retain compatibility for the users that exist. Yeah? So there's some code, particularly uh, when it comes to dealing with the databases that users have uh, uh, on their uh, devices that needs to stay compatible. Um, so there's lots of model code that I want to reuse. Uh, but at the same time, I want to write new code exclusively in Swift. Namely, because I want to embrace Swift in the real world. Yeah? I've been watching Apple release Swift and two years uh, went by and um, I was always thinking, ah, Swift, should I not get into it, should I not? And this uh, project created the opportunity for me to say, okay, now I'm diving into it. Just at the right time uh, because um, the, uh, the other reason why I did that was that I have uh, some material to talk about on this conference. Because uh, when agreeing to do this talk, I was thinking, well, I don't want to waste time specifically preparing something that I don't know anything about, but rather in my daily work, yeah, uh, I wanted to make notes of these uh, aha mo moments I was encountering while dealing with Swift for the first time. And these became this talk. So why, why Swift? Simply because it's more productive. There are lots of uh, good things about it. Here's not a complete list of all the advantages that I found Swift to, to be having. Uh, but the common thread amongst everything that I'm going to show you is that you have incredible savings. Yeah? So think of me like I'm a salesperson and I'm trying to convince you to buy Swift because it's saving you so much. In this case, keystrokes, uh, sweat. So 
The first thing that you notice when you get into Swift is uh, how uh, there's a difference between Objective-C and Swift. In Objective-C, you have a header and you have an implementation for each class, and in Swift, you only have one Swift file. And the first thing you need to understand is how do these interact if you mix and match, that's the term Apple uses, uh, referencing Objective-C code from Swift and vice versa. And this, this chart that I actually found in the documentation, I made it a bit more animated so that I can talk about it, but it's really good. It, it helps you uh, wrap your head around how the individual items relate to each other. So classically, if you wanted to reference a class from an implementation, what you do, you import the header of this other class in your implementation file. Uh, in Swift, you don't have an import for an Objective-C header file, so instead you go via this app bridging header. This app bridging header imports uh, the headers from classes you want to use, and then uh, Xcode makes sure that those are known to your Swift code. Um, the orange app here is uh, a placeholder, basically it's the name of your model, a module, but if you have a single app, that's all you have, then the name of the module is the same as your app name. Uh, if you have uh, Objective-C code in a framework, yeah, in that case, you import the module, which is the name of the fr framework without the dot framework. The other way around, um, you never should, should have imported uh, a class header into another header, but the preferred way to do that would have been with the add class, and you can still use that if you have an Objective-C header, you want to reference a, a Swift class, add obvious C, uh, add, sorry, add class, the name of the, the Swift class, and so you can use it in your Objective-C header. And then from going from Swift to uh, Objective-C implementation, there is uh, another header automatically created for us, uh, again, name of the module dash, dash swift.h, which makes available all the Swift classes from this app to the Objective-C classes inside the same app. So when you get started, you have an Objective-C project, uh, you, you decide, okay, the next class I'm going to write will be in Swift, so you uh, open up the file new, you select Swift file, uh, and as soon as you do that, Xcode asks you, would you like to create a bridging header? And that's very, very convenient. It's a simple thing that it does. It just creates this header and adds it to the uh, build settings. If you say no at this time, um, you have to do that manually, but that's also not magic. You just create an empty header file and uh, into this, uh, you will then uh, add the imports for all the Objective-C uh, classes you want to use in your Swift code. So in terms of defining a class, yeah, we remember in Objective-C you have the class header and you have the implementation. And the first difference here is in Swift you only have the Swift file and there's no separation anymore between defining the interface and implementing it. And this saves you 50% of keystrokes. So that's the first thing you, you see immediately when defining classes, it's half the work. In terms of control flow, um, well, Swift has all the, the things that we know about, a normal uh, for loop, even a for in loop, where you iterate over elements in an array, uh, you have a while condition, two statements, and you have a repeat something until an, a condition is met. A note here that was recently renamed for Swift 2 to repeat because they needed to use the do keyword for something else we're going to talk about. But well, we, we have seen these in C and they're more or less the same, so nothing special there. But the first thing that really jumps out at you is the switch statement. Yeah? So if you have a, a value to consider, uh, the case uh, cases can be way more rich than uh, in Objective-C or in C. Yeah? You can have, uh, uh, well, you must have usually a default implementation. 
unless you are uh, having an enumeration that you're considering, then it's enough if you have all the individual cases covered. But usually, if you're dealing with numbers, you cannot uh, uh, exhaustively describe these, so you usually have to have a default uh, label. And one thing that stumped me is, what do I put in a default? Yeah, if I don't want anything to happen. Well, you still have a break statement. But unlike uh, Objective-C, this break statement is not required because the cases, once they're, they're, their code is done, they're done. They don't fall through like in C. If you want, to uh, want this to happen though, you can. You just add the fall through keyword. And you see two more things here. You see a closed range and an open range. The closed range includes both uh, elements at the end and the open range uh, ends one element before. Yeah, so to remember less than 100 means the last element in this range is 99. About mutability, well in Objective-C we remember uh, that's how you would create an, a mutable array and then you would add an element to that. Um, in this case, uh, I used the modern Objective-C way of writing it, but this doesn't create a mutable array for me. So I needed to mutable copy it so that I actually receive a mutable array. And then I can add something to that. Contrast that with Swift. Um, here, I just create an array. And instead of using let, which was, would make it immutable, I use var. And I end up with a mutable array, and then to this I can simply append something. Isn't that way simpler, way more beautiful yeah, than the, all the code at the top? And uh, in this case, yeah, the var is the key. It saves you 62% uh, of your keystrokes. Mm -hmm. So even more than before. Huh? Uh, let's talk about type inference. That's another awesome thing. Uh, in Objective-C, if you write something like this, yeah, and a string, string equals to some text, um, you could write semantically the same in Swift like this. Yeah? Define a variable uh, named string, give it the type any string, and then assign something. But the compiler knows that some text is a string. Yeah? So you don't need that. Uh, and this small trick, inferring the type of the variable from what you assign to it, saves you 25% of your keystrokes. Talk about type checking. Uh, here we have uh, a base class, a subclass that's derived from it. And we, we create a variable base class of type base and a variable subclass of type subclass. So how would you, would you check the type, say, in a dynamic scenario where you might have base or sub, subclass in an, in an array and de depending on what type it is, you want to do certain things. And Objective-C is kind of class. Yeah? So base class is kind of class. Base class would be true, yeah? because that's the same class. Subclass is kind, of ba base uh, is kind of class. Base class would also be true, because um, it's derived from it. Or you could, uh, is kind of class subclass. Of course, in this case, you know, uh, because you see the variable definition is also true. But in Objective-C, this evaluation is happening at runtime. How does this look like in Swift? Well, there is the is operator. And uh, in this case, subclass is base. Um, the compiler already knows that this is the case. So uh, what it does, it gives you a warning. Well, that's always true, dummy. You don't need to write that. Yeah. And you, you can see Xcode does that even at compile time. And it saves us, saves us the work, basically up front, 53% less keystrokes to do the same thing. Downcasting, that is, uh, if you have a base class variable and uh, you want to treat it as a subclass, it's called downcasting. Yeah, in Objective-C, you would, um, <coughs> uh, no, I'm not talking about Objective-C, but um, in Swift, you do this with the as operator. Yeah? I want to treat something as something else. Yeah? And in this case, I, I intentionally uh, constructed an example that is causing problems because I cannot treat base class as a subclass. Yeah? So, but Swift is so smart in that case, it tells me 
base is not convertible to subclass, do you want to use S exclamation mark? Well, as a, a newbie to Swift, I try what Xcode tells me with the result that the whole app compiles, but it crashes. Because, yeah, even at, uh, if I force something to be a subclass, doesn't mean it's, it's actually a subclass, it's still base. Yeah? So the solution to this, if I wanted to do that dynamically, is not to use as exclamation mark, but as question mark, because in this case, uh, this turns into nil. Hmm? About string man manipulation, another example here. Um, uh, this is ex exactly the same code in Swift and in the Objective-C. Let's walk through it. Uh, so you see in the first line, we have the same thing about mutability. Uh, in Objective-C, I need to specifically create a mutable string. In Swift, I just say var. Yeah. Uh, to append, nice. Yeah. Again, lots of typing in Objective-C. In Swift, I can use an op overloaded operator plus equals that appends to the end of it. Yeah. Here, I create a non-mutable string that contains Krakow. And the next thing we know, append format, we've used it multiple times. Um, something like that exists also in Swift. It's called string interpolation. And that is basically you include the variables right in the string with a backslash round brackets. Yeah? Same, same result. Yeah? And here we see another um, example of an overloaded operator, uh, equal, equal, or exclamation equal also works on strings in Swift. So you don't have to write is equal to string, but you just say equal, equal, or not equal. And of course, NSLog still exists, but through the power of string interpolation, uh, you can include the variables that you're outputting it right, right there. No longer percent add. Yeah, you can use percent add if you so like, but string interpolation makes it more easy to read. Who did the calculation? Who did the math? How much did we save? Well, I did. You save 40% of your keystrokes. Which brings us to optionals. Um, optionals um, in Objective-C, something, if it's optional, it can be nil, but you don't know, is it nil or is it not? And there might be some scenarios where a nil value just doesn't make a sense. Make sense. Yeah. And that's why Swift has a, a strong concept of whether or not something ca could or should be optional. And that's extremely powerful, as you will see in a second. Yeah? So to uh, look at an example, uh, UI text view. All of us have used it multiple times. I've uh, selected three of the properties in there uh, from the Objective-C header of UI text view. And uh, this helps me illustrate the three kinds of nullability there in existence. Yeah? The first one being a normal property that doesn't have anything, in this case, um, text alignment, yeah? is inferred to as non-null. Yeah? They could have written it there, but by omitting it, it's treated as non-optional. Uh, text alignment is a number, and the number zero means left alignment. So that's why it doesn't make sense, because the text label needs to be aligned, and the default value is left. So nil wouldn't make any sense here. There is an op optional that can be nil uh, in the case of font. Yeah? Uh, of course, if you set the font to nil, or the default is nil, uh, you will still see some text, be because the uh, your text uh, view uh, has a default font, but um, in this case, you can set it to nil and then it will use that. Yeah? And there's a third type, uh, null resettable, in the case with text. Um, if you think about it, does nil have any purpose or would it, would it make sense to have nil for the text of a text view? Well, the shortest text you can have is an empty string, but it's still a string, not Null. And that's the reason why this is null resettable. You can assign nil, but if you then try to get out the text, you still end up with an empty length string. Yeah? So null resettable means 
it can't really be null, but you can reset it with nil. Uh, so what about messaging or accessing what's inside optional uh, values, values that can be nil? Yeah. Uh, so if you do, if you have a variable that contains nil and you try to force it, exclamation, it's forceful. Yeah. What happens? Yeah. Um, and what happens if you uh, use it with a question mark? So in the case of the exclama uh, exclamation mark, you get a runtime exception. Uh, because this is now a strong, strong thing that uh, uh, shouldn't shouldn't be. Yeah, you, you cannot unwrap nil. Yeah. Uh, but in the case of the question mark, it's like you ask it friendly: Are you nil? Yeah, I or uh, rather, are you not nil? In this case, it fails gracefully. And how you can remember that is the exclamation mark is sort of be careful. That might cause an exception. And the question mark is: Are you sure? So that's that's a kind of kind of funny if you look at a longer uh, sentence in Swift and you have exclamation mark and question mark yeah, to read that out loud. We'll have an example shortly. Um, and what's great about that is yet you can chain optionals. Yeah. So here's an example. There's a uh, variable foo of type my class and it's optional, so it can be nil. I don't know. We'll we'll have to check at runtime. So the classic way in Objective, uh, or, or rather how si similar to how Objective-C might, might have done it, was to uh, compare it to nil, and only if I know for certain that it's not nil, then I can wrap, unwrap the op optional with an exclamation mark yeah, and do something with it. But there's, that's a bit clunky, and it's too much like Objective-C. So, um, there's a, another way to do that, uh, that's the if let. Um, if let basically implements um, the check together with an unwrapping of the optional. And you can see uh, in the line below, I don't have an exclamation mark anymore because I created a local version of foo that's unwrapped. Yeah? And if let something is something is only true if the second something is not nil. Yeah? So essentially, those two do the same, but it's way more elegant to say, I'm going to do something if it's not nil. But that's still not quite elegant. It's just where well, you, these are the, the iterations you walk through mentally when you start dealing with optionals. In the end, you discover this. No, actually, this you already knew about. Yeah? Objective C, you can message nil and nothing happens. Yeah. Often we did that. Yeah. Foo do something, and if, if foo is nil, nothing happens. Yeah. So that would be an advantage of Objective-C, so much shorter than in Swift. Well, Swift can do the same. Yeah. You can use the question mark unwrapping, and you end up with the same effect. Yeah. If foo is not nil, then do something happens. And in this case, we save 8% of keystrokes. And the, the cool thing about optionals, you can chain them. Yeah? So here's an example uh, from Objective-C. You have a delegate method um, uh, that has an optional uh, function uh, or method. Uh, so, sort of, sorry. A delegate protocol that has an optional method. Yeah? And in Objective-C, you would have to check if the delegate responds to the selector, i.e. if it's implemented, and only then you can uh, do something with it. Yeah? Um, because the delegate might be set, so not nil, but it might not have this selector. And if you message that, you get unrecognized selector crash. Yeah? So how do, do you do that in Swift? Amazingly, much shorter. In this case, that's one of those examples with multiple question marks. So think of it like, is there a delegate? Yes. Does it have a do maybe? Yes. Okay, in that case, call it, do something with it. In this case, this is a record-breaking 82% of keystrokes saved. So implicit optionality, um, something to be aware if you have a class that has a property that's not optional, yeah, if you have an optional variable of this type of this class, uh, 
then the result of an optional chain will always also be optional. Yeah? So if there's anything optional in your chain, it makes the entire thing optional, which is great because then you can use if let uh, to do something with it if, it if the result is not nil after all of these optional things being changed. Um, and uh, yeah, that's something to be aware of that uh, you end up with, with an optional thing out of a thing that's usually, uh, originally not optional. So here's a, a more uh, extensive example. Something that I like to do myself quite often if I have uh, a storyboard for my app and I'm branching out to different view controllers, um, I don't like to uh, use the identifier of the segue to uh, determine uh, how to prepare the view controller I'm going to, but rather I'd like to check the type of the view controller and then based on that uh, assign my properties. Yeah? So this is more or less the same in Swift. Yeah? Uh, it does one thing at the top, um, or actually let me, before I get to that, where am I now? Um, before I explain it, I would want to show that in, in the Swift part, there is a shorter version of uh, what you could do. And this um, basically uh, uses the as question mark operator to convert the destination view controller optionally into a view controller, a, a navigation controller. And then the, if it has, if it indeed is a navigation controller, get the top view controller. And what I'm achieving with this is, if I have a segue to something that's wrapped in a navigation controller, I don't, I'm not interested in the navigation controller. I'm interested in the top view controller of the navigation controller so that I can uh, set some property on it when I'm navigating to it. And that's the reason why I'm doing this. But in this case, that's a bit difficult to read. So that's not what we like to do. Yeah. So, this is what I said, yeah. Uh, I'm looking at the kind of class of the navigation controller. And if it is a navigation controller, then I get the top view controller. And then based on this actual destination, um, in Objective-C parlance, yeah, I need to check if it's the class, then I need to typecast it, and then I can call the property. Whereas in Swift, I can just say, if let, as question mark, so is this a view controller, and if this is really the case, then the result is not nil, and then I can set the property. And this does the, the checking and the conversion and the nil checking all at the same time, which is fabulous. Yeah? Saves us 13% of keystrokes. Nil coalescing, yeah? that's, that's also a thing. Um, it's been around in C, since C existed, I think. Um, and you speak of nil coalescing, think of the scenario, you have a variable that might be nil, but regardless uh, if it's nil or not, you want to display some text. Yeah? So if it's not nil, you want to display its content. If it is nil, you want to display some default value. Hmm? And you could do that with a long if or so, but uh, there's an operator uh, for this purpose. So this is the, the long winded way. Yeah? If there's not an answer, then set the answer to the default value. Uh, even in Objective-C, you could use the nil coalescing operator question mark colon to achieve that. Yeah? So if the possibly nil value is nil, then it instead uses the default value. And of course, um, something like this exists in Swift 2, and it's question mark, question mark. And what's important in that case is that you have spaces to the left and right of these question marks because otherwise the compiler gives you an error because it can't tell it apart from unwrapping. Yeah? But the question mark directly follows the possibly nil. So this is one drawback, but we still save 11% of keystrokes. Let's get to structs. Structs are something really aw awesome in uh, Swift because you can um, use structs to represent a value not something that you want to pass references around and then have this headache of uh, making copies of it. But in, in my case, in this app, 
uh, I used uh, a struct to represent a temperature. Yeah? And this temperature, uh, we have uh, a struct here as opposed to a normal class. And uh, it's got two initializers because uh, I, I can, depending on the locale of the user, uh, she can either set uh, the temperature um, in Celsius or in Fahrenheit. So I have two initializers that end up setting the internal property temperature in Celsius. And the thing that we show uh, here at the top, uh, at the bottom, is that you can also create your own operator overloads. Yeah? So I needed to know if two temperatures are the same. And in this case, I've defined that they are the same if they are uh, the same uh, until the first uh, point, uh, first digit behind the comma. Yeah? Um, and if you wonder why is this outside of the struct, that is because uh, operators are sort of global functions. Yeah? That always, <laughs> if it's a binary operator, i.e. has a left side and a right side, um, then those are passed as the parameters. Uh, and uh, this way you can create overloaded operators for just about anything you like. So these are sort of the, the, the first few things that were um, kind of amazing to me. And then Apple uh, invents uh, Swift 2, or rather introduces it at WWDC. And I was thinking, oh my god, why do they change everything? Yeah. And I sort of ignored it until the, the very last moment, until suddenly uh, one day uh, Xcode had updated with, without me doing anything. Yeah? Because they just pushed Xcode 7 through the App Store, and then my computer was on Xcode 7. Everything, I got lots of warnings, lots of errors, nothing did compile, and then I had to migrate to Swift 2. But I'm happy to report the whole process uh, was quite enlightening, because there are a few things that changed in Swift 2, not fundamentally, but once you figured out sort of this warning is this solution, this warning is this solution, then you, I, I migrated two projects the same day in, I don't know, two hours. Yeah. Because it's basically just replacing certain patterns you had before with some other pattern. And I'm going to show a few of these patterns if, in case you stumble across these yourself. Um, it's really easy to convert to Swift 2. So um, a few of the, the things that are uh, here to be considered are that um, we have the, the do try x catch that replaces previous uh, NS error pattern. We have bit masks replaced by option sets. We have guard statements. We have the availability checking. Uh, and these four, I will give examples. And strings internally are no longer a collection, so you can't use length on it. Yeah? But that's got, got some reasons. Yeah? Uh, and it's, it's not something that I want to go into detail about. But the four things at the top are the, <coughs> the main interesting changes in, in uh, Swift 2. If you have already worked on a Swift 1.2 code base, this is basically what I needed to do to switch on this one day. Yeah. So NS error handling looked like this traditionally. Yeah, you would have defined a optional NS error. You would call managed object context safe. And if that was false, uh, an error happened and you would get an instance of NS error in your optional variable. And this compiles not anymore because uh, Xcode says, well, there's an error parameter where there shouldn't be none. So you look it up on Stack Overflow and basically replace it with this. Yeah. You just put a try in front of it, put it in a do block, and the, the NS logging of the error you do in the catch block. And honestly, I like this new approach much more because it's more clear. It's more like I'm trying something, and if it fails, I deal with the error. I had many places where I would do a managed object context save without a parameter, just passed null because I don't care. Yeah, too much writing, too much boiler code. And when migrating um, iWoman to Swift 2, I found one place where, because I then pasted in this, this code that actually logged the error, 
I actually was uh, making a false assumption. And now I would, would see, I was trying to save an inc incomplete object where some property was missing that was non-optional. And this actually showed it to me. Yeah? So I, I like this, this new pattern more. Yeah? And it's basically almost the same amount of code. So. Option sets, yeah, a classic one, the auto resizing mask of view. Yeah. In the past, those were sort of bit, bit masks that you would or together with these uh, pipe symbols. Lots of problems and ugliness about that, and that's why uh, Apple decided, well, let's make these real sets. Yeah. And a set you define with uh, square brackets and then the individual values with commas. And yeah, it's it's, it's nicer like that. And another uh, side effect of this is if you don't want to specify an option, in the past you would have said you are view resizing none or the, you are view resizing square bracket zero or sometimes I saw raw value zero, yeah? Nothing of that you do anymore. Uh, if you don't have any options for uh, an option set, you just pass empty square brackets. That's it. Yeah, not, not even nil because often these op option, options are not nullable, but an empty option set is just the two square brackets. Another concept that I like to use very often, I, I don't like to have ifs that are in ifs and ifs and ifs and ifs, yeah? but the, the concept to avoid that is called early return. Yeah? So you check something and if this condition is not met, you return out of the function. Then you check the next thing. If it's not met, you return out of the function. It's called early return and in the voids having such a, such a big tree of ifs. And uh, Apple added something really nice to model this, uh, namely the guard statement. Yeah? The guard statement is basically like an if, but you, you formulate the opposite. So you don't say, if something is not, I return. You say, the condition that I want to make sure is you put in the if, you always have an else. Guard statements don't have a then, yeah? they only have the else. And in the else, you have to return. Yeah? And if you don't put a return in the else, uh, you get a compiler warning. So it has to either be a return or a break, yeah? if it's in a loop, that you have to, to re return in the else. And what's also different about guard is as soon as you are after the guard, um, all the variables that you define with uh, let inside the guard are still available. So let's look at this example. Um, here I'm uh, checking if the dictionary has more than zero values. Yeah? Then I have multiple lets. That's also something you can do since quite recently that uh, you don't have to write let URL string equals let URL equals let ITAC equals. You can just have one let and then chain this with a comma. Yeah? And at the end, I still uh, I have another normal Boolean operation. And you might wonder, why does it say where now when at the top it was just the normal statement? Well, if you try that, you can try to just replace it with a comma. Um, then you will get this Xcode error. Boolean condition requires where to separate it from variable binding. So you can think of a, as a where as an additional condition after a let chain or block. Each let can have its own where. Yeah? And in this case, because I chained uh, four, four lets together, this where is uh, basically for everything, but you could have a where if, if you added lets for the individual, individual uh, lines, you could have a where for each of these lines. That doesn't make sense in this case. This is the, the most um, uh, elegant way to write it, in my opinion. And the cool thing, uh, so at the end, after this check, I know that um, dictionary count is greater than zero. There is a URL string in the dictionary by this key. I can make it into a URL, which doesn't have to be necessarily the case. Yeah? Not, any, not every string is a valid URL. Uh, there is an I tag in the dictionary, there is a type in the dictionary, and the type contains video MP4. Yeah? So 
I, th I think this is kind of nice to read. Yeah? You see, uh, these are the preconditions that are necessary uh, and only if these are met, then I want to continue processing at the bottom. And if not, I return false in that case. All right, um, av availability checking. Yeah? Uh, you remember the times when in Objective-C codes you would have to uh, check uh, if some, some uh, selector existed, yeah, response to selector, or if certain classes existed where we would do uh, any string from class, then the class name, and if that was not nil, then we knew, okay, the class exists and we can instantiate it. Um, that's how Apple taught us we should do it for many, many years. Until uh, last year, or when they started with Swift, uh, when they actually started to discourage that, the official reason they started giving was, well, the class might be there, but it might be private, so that's not safe. Yeah? Rather, you should do, do this. Yeah? NS process info uh, got a new method, is operating system at least version, and then you pass in a, a new NS operating system version of 900, and that would allow you to check, yes, at runtime, I'm on iOS 9. But you can see this is like lots of code, it's really clunky, and that's why they basically did away with it after just one year. And we now have something beautiful as this, where you just say, if available, iOS 9. You can also restrict versions on, on Mac, on tvOS, yeah. Um, and in the, in the if, in the then uh, brackets, uh, you only end up uh, if you are indeed running on iOS 9. And in this case, because in my example, I had a deployment target of iOS 9, the compiler even told me, well, that's not really necessary. Yeah? You, you couldn't be running on anything else. Um, so you again see there, there are lots of uh, ways how the compiler already, while I'm writing the code, is able to reason about it. And that's the thing that, that makes uh, writing Swift so, so cool. Yeah. So why Swift now? Yeah. Well, version 2 was released with iOS 7. And uh, there's already a beta for 2.1 uh, out as part of Xcode 7.1. Yeah. But you know this, this old uh, saying, you shouldn't start with version 1 because it's full of bugs. But once you have version 2, that's good good to go. So we are at version two, so now we're good to go with Swift. Um, another reason is um, technically you can target everything from iOS 7 and above with Swift, but there's a catch with that. Um, it's, that's good if all your code is only in your app, but if you have third-party Swift code um, or even your own Swift code that you put uh, in some framework or, or static library or something, Swift can't be in static libraries. It can only be contained in apps or in frameworks, dynamic frameworks. And those only exist since iOS 8. So even though you could make an iOS 7 app really useful, it's only since iOS 8. And then there's this saying, well, at least from the point of view of Apple, you should always support the current stable operating system release uh, as well as the one before. And because of this, iOS 7 basically falls to the side. And iOS 8 and iOS 9 both support modules and frameworks. And because of this, it makes sense to also uh, start with, with uh, Swift because it supports it. And as I've shown you, you save between 8% and 82% of what you write. Now think of all this, this time that you're saving as a developer. Yeah? You model certain things and you get out shorter, more concise, more easy to read, safer code. Yeah? So what's there not to love about it? And it's the overall language features uh, of, of Swift uh, make it really, really beautiful, in my opinion. I've, I've, I fell in love with it. Um, and as I've seen myself, yeah, migrating from 1.2 to 2.0 to is relatively painless. Yeah? It's just replacing some things with some new things, yeah, and I don't foresee, my, my feeling tells me there's not anything really breaking that Apple would do anymore. It's 
mostly refinements of the language uh, that, that we get with, with updates. And because of this, I encourage all of you, start with Swift today. And that's the end of my talk. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.